isn't it? Another day to be alive, another day to thank God for everything is that we have here today. I had the privilege last night of going, uh, my son, one of my sons took me out to see the uh, New England Patriots, and I'll tell you what, they look really, really good. And uh, the only thing is, he, we had beautiful tickets, but he, pa he actually, um, he dropped us off where we had the $20, you know, the parking tickets. And so we had to end up walking like two and a half miles to the game. But I had a good time. I was just about getting ready to complain about it. Or may I say, bitch and complain. But then I was reminding me of, we've got this beautiful family that has come all the way over from Australia. How can I complain about that? Julie, Julie, stand up. Julie, Julie, stand up for one second. Julie, stand up. Sierra, Sierra, stand up. Haley, Haley, Haley. Eliza, is that right? And Esther. All right. Thank you. Five fine ladies. Thank you. Thank you for showing up, coming all that way. You really did do that. I was going to say, I'm kind of tired tonight, so I'm going to maybe, you know, just cut it a little bit short. But I saw you ladies, and I said, no way can I use that as a complaint. And then I saw, I saw John talking to you, and I said, I better really rescue you now, because once he gets talking, you, you don't know what's going to happen. So anyway... <laughs> Anyway, it's good to have a good crowd out tonight. Let's take our moment of silent prayers we normally do to give ourselves the opportunity to enter into fellowship with God, naming and citing any known sins if we have any. Also, if there's something that might be troubling us, now is not the time to concentrate on any of our problems, but now is the time to give our undivided attention to the Word of God as it is being spoken. With that in mind, let us pray. Father, we are grateful that you've given us this privilege to gather together and to study your word. We thank you that you have taken our friends and our royal family, our sisters in Christ all this way, and you protected them in the travel and mercies that they needed. We ask that you also just be with them at this time. Let them enjoy a beautiful time here in being in Client Nation, USA. We thank you for their tremendous grace showing us how much they love your word, Father. We also pray for those who are going through different forms of sicknesses right now, Father. You know who they are. We ask that you just touch them and let the Holy Spirit see exactly what is needed so that the doctors can continue to touch them and heal their particular bodies, whatever it may be. We ask it in the name of Christ, we do pray. pray. Amen. Once again, turning your Bibles this evening to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter 10. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. We're going to con uh, continue, of course, with our study upon what we have been noting, and we're going to be dealing with some very interesting principles, especially when it comes to what our Lord is going to say concerning the principle of pruning. Hopefully that is going to come out this evening, if not, maybe by as soon as Sunday morning. But we begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes this, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud. Notice that our fathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. By the way, this is their identification with Moses and with the sea and with the cloud that Moses is identified with. They, and that's why we do not have a wet baptism here. We have a baptism that is dry. They were all baptized or identified into Moses, not into the sea as we've already noted, but into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And not only were they identified with Moses in the cloud and the sea, they were also identified with Moses with the same spiritual food that Moses ate. He ate that manna from heaven, manna from heaven, which they ended up enjoying in the beginning, but ended up murmuring and complaining about uh, later on. And they not only uh, ate that same spiritual food, but then we find out that then when they were uh, approaching the wilderness, and they were walking around for about almost maybe 40 years, the Bible does teach that, in, in one square mile. And they also not only were used to the manna from heaven, they were used to this water that came out of of a rock. That was a supernatural water. They took that for granted after a period of time. So that's what it says when he, when he, means, he says in verse 4 what he means when he says they all drank that same spiritual rock. This wasn't the normal principle of water. This was the water that came out of a rock. This was a miracle. And after a period of time, miracles are something that God's people get used to and then they take for granted. For example, how many times have we been healed from a physical sickness, which in many cases is a miracle. But after a period 
in time, we take it for granted. Or what about the, uh, the, the, the lepers? All of a sudden, God heals us and ten go away, only one comes back and says thank you. This is something that the Lord has to deal with throughout human history, and it will, comp it will actually compete, it will reach its ultimate when we reach a point in the millennial reign where we find out that the people that God had blessed for 1,000 years are still murmuring and complaining in spite of the blessings. So these things, however, the Bible says, even though they drank of the same spiritual rock, uh, drink which came out of that rock, that was a tremendous miracle. It followed them, and the rock, of course, was a reference to Christ. Then he says these things happened as examples for who? For us, not for anyone else. This is for us right now, that we should not crave evil or lust after the evil as they also craved, and that we do not get involved in idolaters, be not idolaters. That will have another meaning that we'll see across the, again this evening. As some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat, they drink, they stood up and to play. To what? To play. Why? The reason being here is because they did not worship, they did not worship our Lord and Savior, and they were also being used to misleading people into the false doctrines, into the false gods that were around the area at the time. When Israel left, don't forget, when Israel left Egypt, they went to all these other kind of different places like the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the, you know, the different ites that are out there. What were they doing? They were actually uh, being uh, deceived by the fact that they would also have their own religions, these different gods. And then they got mixed up with the religions, but more than that, they got mixed up with the sexual relationships that took place after the religious after they compromised their religious discipline or their religious doctrines but again that's why the Bible says this these things happened as examples for us so that we should not do what they did we should not crave evil things as they also craved and we should not be idolaters as some of them were and now the idolatry is being described as it is written notice what it says the people sat down again they sat down to eat and drink and they stood up to play. The eating and the drinking, that's religion. The standing up to the standing up to play, there's your sexual relationships that all the religions, basically the majority of them all had in the ancient world. And so the re a reason again that we mention this, the reason why we actually mention these things, when he says that the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play, it simply means that they were more lovers of self more than they were lovers of God. And inevitably we know that that always comes to a point where we reap what we sow, which a lot of individuals do not like to reap what they sow, but that's the, that's the natural law God has provided. We, can't cho we cannot change that. And so these were some of the reasons, again, that they got involved with what we call the orgy at Shittim. That's exactly what it's talking about. While Israel was camped at Shittim, we, had, we read that there was a Keisha grove. They used that for religious worship. And then we see that the men began to have sex with the Moabite women. The Moabite women women were very beautiful women. They were dark-skinned women. The Jewish women were nowhere near as beautiful as they were, but they ended up taking the religion, which is what the kingdom of darkness is always going to do. Start out with religion, start out with legalism, but end up with some form of immorality to take people away from their relationship with God. And that's why we read in verse 8, nor let us act immorally, as some of them did. Why? As 3,000 fell. Notice this, 3,000 fell in what? One one day, 3,000 people fell in one day. That's why it says, nor let, us try, uh, tr nor let us try to test the Lord as some of them did, and they were destroyed by the what? That's a, a reference to the serpents. They're now going to be destroyed by that. Nor, he says this, nor grumble. Do not grumble as some of them did, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. And again, that is a reference to what we have here is the orgy of Shittim. Now, it started when the woman, by the way, the woman started it out like they always do, a nice little invitation to, you know, church. A nice little inter invitation to some form of the, you know, celebrate, you come to my church, I'll come to yours. I come to your church, you come to mine, that sort of thing. Then once you get there, the false doctrine comes in, and then inevitably we're going to enter into not living the spiritual life, but being drawn away from the life of God. Why? Because you're now involved with sensuality, as we have seen. So this is nothing new. This has been going on through human history ever since the creation of sex, by the way, by 
It, it, it started out in the Garden of Eden, remember? When, uh, what, what happened in the Garden of Eden? She gave the fruit to the man, and then what happened after that? They developed a relationship. They re, they chose, he chose the woman and sex over their relationship with God. We've seen it many times before. And again, notice what he says in verse 11. It started out with the women inviting the men to their sex and religion worship type of uh, situation. Then notice what it says in verse 11. These things happen to them as an example. Here we go again. Back in verse 6, it's an example for who? To us. Back in verse 11, these things happen to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have now come. And when he says the ends of the ages have now come, we're living in that time right now. It doesn't take too much of a, you don't have to have a, a, bright, a brain, brain have a, you know, be a, be a brain, what do I want to try to say? Uh, you don't have to have the brain of a rocket scientist. Let me go slow and say it like that. Forgive me. All you have to do is realize these things always take place. We constantly see it over and over again where sex and religion are being mixed. And that's why he says, be careful in verse 12. He says, let him who thinks that he stands, be careful lest he think that he what? Lest he falls. If you think you're standing and you're being deceived by these kind of things, religion, by the way, mixed with the sexual immorality. It says, let the one who thinks that they stand take heed lest they fall. No temptation. This is the very popular passage, but I want you to remain in context. There's no temptation that has overtaken you, but such is common to man, but God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with that temptation do what? He'll provide the way of what? A way of escape. There's always that way of escape that so that the last part can be a reality that we may endure it. We can endure any problem, any difficulty that we face because there's always that way of escape. And that's why, look at verse 14. I want you to see how it goes from religion to legalism, back to sexual immorality. Here we go again. Verse 14, therefore, my beloved, what does he tell us to flee from? Idolatry. Why? That's where the sex came in. It started out with religion. It ended up in sexual relationships. And then finally he says this. I speak as to wise men. You know what I say. You judge, you judge what I say. This is what really happened to them. What really happened to them. Let me remind you something I gave you the other day. And I want to give it to you again because of the uniqueness of it. They remember they went from bondage to faith. Remember? They left Egypt. They had to leave that place of bondage. They were in slavery for almost 400, and five, maybe 500 years, but over 400. So they had faith. They had left Egypt. God said, I want you to leave Egypt. And God brought the 10 miracles of the 10 plagues. And he says, you're going to have to have faith that these are going to work. And then you're going to go to the Red Sea. You're going to have to have faith that that Red Sea is going to open. You're going to have faith that God, Moses is my man. So you're going to have to learn to go from bondage to faith. And that's what they did when they left Egypt. Then now that they left Egypt, they go from faith because now they're realizing what it's like to be a child of God, to be of the nation of Israel, to be Jews, they went from faith to great courage. It took a lot of courage when someone said, I want you to walk through this path. You're going to have to walk on the other side, and this, this ocean right here is going to be part in two. That takes courage to, find, to go forward with that. They had that. And then once they, once they did that, they got on the other side of what? The other side of the sea. So now they go from courage to liberty. And once they went from courage to liberty, now they've got Joshua leading them. The old, uh, the old or the old generation where they were losers. Their parents were losers. This generation was not, and so they had the they had the leading of Joshua who gave them military victory. So they went from having now courage to liberty. Then they went from liberty to abundance. What happened? Now that they became a nation, David led the nation in its military victories, and the nation went out had all kinds of military victories, and they went from liberty to now go having going through the abundance and the abundance was David's military victories which came in abundance and after that no one wanted to fight with them because no one wants to pick on the big bully in school you've seen, you've seen that before and so no one wanted to fight with the Jews that they all lived in fear of David's military not Solomon Solomon was just resist he was just reflecting or he was just reaping at all the things his son David had done for him so now we go from David's military Military victories. We go from that abundance to now Solomon has everything. He can't even go to war. No one wants to fight him. 
So he goes from abundance to complacency. And that's when Solomon has his riches. He enters into the complacency. Inevitably, that leads to apathy, vanity. So we go from complacency to apathy. And once you get there, the children of Israel have now left God. So God says, I want you to draw them back to me. Tell them to repent. Tell them to come back. Even John the Baptist, when he comes on the scene, he's going to say, come back. You need to come back. Why? That's the old ministry. You have to get back away from that apathy. But they did not. They rejected Isaiah. Isaiah, by the way, I hope God never calls me to do something he ever did, but he had to go around for three years with no clothes on, naked. With the message, I sure got people's attention. If you said Pastor Bob's going to be speaking, well, I don't know if they'll come to see Pastor Bob, but if you said someone else was going to be speaking nude for about three years, I think he'd get some attention around here. Anyway, that's not a subject. They went from complacency to apathy. Isaiah and Jeremiah, they went through all kinds of problems because the people had rejected the Messiah once again. And so from apathy, where did they go? They go right back into dependence, and that refers to the Jews going right back to rejection rejecting their Lord and Savior, and then they fell right back into dependence, back into bondage once again, and on and on it goes, and nobody, where it stops, nobody what? Nobody knows, but you know who knew? Hegel. Hegel says if we've learned something from history, we've learned nothing from it. And that's exactly what happens to us. It's just a merry-go-round over and over again. But you can make a, dis a difference because even though the generations can be destroyed, you can be the one, the light of the world, the light of the family. One woman can change the entire outcome of, in of her family. One man can do the same thing. We can break that curse. But without that curse, we have a third and fourth generation curse, and we're under this as our life. That's our lifestyle. I don't know about you. It's nothing I'd like to live in at all. Because then finally when you actually go from all of this and you don't find the truth, then I told you also which originated with me and I like it that it did, but your name will be in that obituary in heaven which will reveal if you are a winner believer and if you are, you will be rewarded for being so. Being what? A winner believer. And please do some insight right now. Notice what I neglected to mention because it doesn't require mentioning it. It's not worthy to be mentioned. Let me say it again. Your name will be in the obituary in heaven, which will reveal if you are a winner believer. And if you are not, you will be rewarded for being so. Take your, take any, anybody want to know what's missing? Nothing about the losers mentioned. Do you notice that? If you don't see, you're going to be a loser believer, do you? See, gotcha. Do you see you're going to be a loser believer on the board? Caught you. Of course you don't see that. Why? Because sometimes they're not worthy. How, what's Satan's name? Sometimes evil is not worthy to be mentioned. We don't even know what his name is. We call him the devil. That's a title. We call him Satan. That's another title for adversary. We call him lawyer, advocate, devil. We don't know his name. Well, how do we have We don't always have to recognize that where there's winners, there's losers. That should be something that we conclude is something that we conclude automatically follows. Here's the point again. If we desire to glorify the Lord, we must begin with the glass being what? Half full not half empty. Look at your life as being one that's half full, not half empty. The main issue is the viewpoint you have as an individual. Is it positive or negative? It doesn't matter what you're going through. If, the, if it's positive, you can take a negative situation and can turn it into a blessing. If it's negative or positive, you can turn it into the other. If you desire, it all requires what you want to think. It all requires how you're going to handle the situation. Good to see you there, Brian. Just, just recognize you, my lost Lord and prodigal son. How you been doing? Good. You came all this way to see these people come. And all these girls had to come all the way from they had to come all the way from the other side of the world to finally get your attention. <laughs> Only teasing you. Good to have you back. Good to see you anyway. I don't know if you're back, but it's just good to see you. Anyway, let me give you a few, a few principles here that now they actually apply to all of our lives. Turn your Bibles right now to the book of Luke chapter 6. 
<clears throat> Luke chapter 6, and I'm going to uh, give you some of the principles that we're going to see as far as the athlete is concerned, and as far as the military man is concerned as well. So let's get cracking, and as soon as we get concentrating on this, we're going to see exactly all these great blessings that the Lord has given us, and should, it should actually lead us to a great weekend coming up. But the Apostle Paul also wrote something. He wrote that the athlete had to undergo 10 months of strict training just to qualify and participate in the games. He couldn't just say, I want to participate in the games. He had to go through strict training just to qualify and to participate in the games. For example, first of all, you had to have, you had to enter that registered state gymnasium. It was analogous to living in the pre-designed plan of God. Before you can sign up to be in the military for God or a Christian soldier or in the athletic games for the Lord, the games, running the race that is set before for you, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, but they both say it, whether it's military or whether it's uh, athletics. But you had to register. You had to register the state gymnasium. People knew, and that was analogous, again, they, people knew that you were going to go out for the games, not necessarily that you would make it. However, that's analogous to living in the pre-designed plan of God. For many of you, your life has been actually before people. It's been a living epistles. People have looked at your life and they're looking to see whether or not you're living in this plan that you said was the only plan to live in or whether or not you've chosen not to. Number two, every athlete also went through identical training. When we fall back on the principle of uh, mystery doctrine for the church age, it falls back onto what? Equal privilege, equal opportunity. So every athlete had to go through identical training no matter what the event was. So no one could say what someone had it better than others. No, it was almost like, the, I don't know if you remember, years ago they used to have this uh, worldwide of sports and they used to always have guys uh, participate in all kinds of events, not just theirs. But here's the same type of thing. Every athlete went through the identical training no matter what his event. He had that equal privilege, by the way, equal opportunity. Number three, then just like, I don't know if you watched this past week with, uh, uh, who was it, um, I forget, one of the golfers was trying to, he was trying to make the cut and he could not. Same thing happens, it didn't happen to Tiger Wood. I think Tiger Woods made the cut, I'm not even sure that he did, but someone tried to and he did not make it. Why? Same principle here. Number three, only the protocol Christian, the one who knows the rules, the one who knows what God to expect, the one who knows how to pray, when to pray, who to pray to, etc. The one who knows if they can talk to Jesus, talk to the Father, if that's okay. That's the protocol Christian. That's the one who knows the rules. And only the protocol Christian is living that Christian way of life. Therefore, he can compete in the spiritual games found as long as he understands the rules where? Of the angelic conflict. If we don't understand the angelic conflict, throw your life away. It's worth nothing. Absolutely. I can prove it to you doctrinally. If you don't understand the reason why you have been created, the reason why you are here, and what the rules are when it comes to glorifying God in the midst of that reason, you can't glorify God. If you do, you have every opportunity to do so, but that's going to require you being faithful, picking up the, your cross day by day, dying daily, continuing in the word. You'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. You know, we tend to say that, you know, we admire discipline in all areas, but when it comes to the Word of God, sometimes we don't admire discipline in that area. It's almost like we say, well, just kind of close your eyes and think God is going to come through for you. No, it has, you have to train. You have to train more for this profession, I believe, than any other profession in the universe. You know why? This is the one that determines your eternal destiny. Forget about your physical destiny. That's so important. We want doctors that are physically trained. How much more should we have doctors that are spiritually trained when they determine the eternal destiny? Well, the medical realm, that's just de destiny and time. Doesn't it make sense? But then, of course, the, the Christian way of life doesn't make a lot of sense to individuals, so what does it matter? Principle number four, the athlete, or also known in the Greek as the athletai, A-T-H-L-E-T-A-I, as they were known, they were the ones who trained under the rules, notice this, of the national gymnasium for 10 months. It doesn't mean that they were going for the gyms. These are the kind of people, if you've ever worked out, most of you, I know some of you do work out on a consistent basis, you know there's some people that just go there just to work out. Same here. There's some people that live in God's plan just to remain there. 
they don't have any great intentions as of yet. Maybe God will touch them in time, but they don't really have a goal as of yet. Well, they would fall under the athlete or the atleti. No, they were the ones who trained under the rules of the national gymnasium for the 10 months. They want to glorify. Maybe they do, maybe they do not. It doesn't really matter what they want. It matters what they are going to do and not how they're going to back up what they want with that principle of volition. But this was their time to train for the games. It was a time for them to be sure to learn how to respect something very vital. If you're going to be successful in the military, if you're going to be successful in the games, you have to learn to respect authority. In fact, you were not allowed to leave that large walled area of the gymnasium for 10 months until you learn to exercise under the authority of the gymnasiak. There he is again. Who's the gymnasiak? He's the ruler of the gym. He's the ruler the one who rules and he's the one that's in charge. He's equivalent to your pastor teacher. Your pastor teacher is working you out in the spiritual realm. Paul said it. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 and 8 since we're going to get a little bit uh, more info here. Since I like doing this when God gives me something while we're teaching these things. But I like how Paul uses this. 1 Timothy 4. <clears throat> he talks about this throughout. In fact, he talks about this more than he talks about this in just uh, 1 Timothy. He talks about it in other areas as well. But look at verse 6. He says, in pointing out these things, 1 Timothy, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 1 Timothy 4, 6. In pointing out these things to the brethren, he's talking to Timothy, Paul speaking, you will be a good servant, a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nursed on the words of the faith, the doctrine, the sound doctrine which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables. They're fit only for the old, old women, on the other hand. Discipline yourself. Notice this. Notice the word. You discipline yourself for the purpose of what? Godliness. Living God, the godly life. Godliness is your word, you survive. And there it is right there. He's saying, again, have nothing to do with family, uh, family uh, worldly fables, fit only for old women, meaning things that were happening in like the nursing homes, etc. That's it's really a, uh, a negative quirk on that. Anyway, it says, on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Why? Because physical discipline, the bodily discipline, that's only for, that's of a little profit. It only lasts when? for this life. Notice what he says. For a physical discipline is only of a little profit, but godliness, that's much more profitable for all things. Why? Since godliness, when you're trained by godliness, it holds promise for the present life and what else? The life what? The life to come. The greatest exercise program you can think of right now is the one you're on right now. Be why? Because of what it says in verse 8. Because it not only offers profit for time, it offers profit for all of the eternal life. That's a part of your gymnastic or the gymnastiac. So you are not allowed to leave the large walled area of the gymnasium for 10 months. You had to exercise under the authority of the gymnasiac, the ruler of the, the, I'm sorry, I didn't have it, the ruler of this teacher. I can't see that word. The ruler of the gym, there it is. I can't see that, Rick. It's a, bit, uh, a little bit too low. So anyway, I'll be back to Luke 6.40. Notice what Luke 6.40 says. A pupil is what? I'll wait for you to get there. Luke 6. <clears throat> Although it's on the board, but I'm going to give you time to get there. I'll take a little coffee, tea. You were not allowed to leave that large area, but I want you to notice what Paul, what the uh, Lord said about the pupil. He says, the pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, that's the attitude, that's the job of the pastor teacher, to fully train you. He'll be like his teacher. Everyone, after he has been fully what? fully trained after he has been trained, then he's going to be like his teacher. Now, it's important to note that when it says that it does not mean to be like him or to mimic him. It doesn't mean you look at your, how he acts or how he talks or how what he wears or what his vocabulary is like. It means that you are not going to mimic him. It means you're going to, you are going to mimic his dedication, his devotion that they have to live the spiritual life. What was it that Paul said to the Philippians? He said, he said, 
brother and he says, follow my example. The things you've seen, you've seen, you've heard about me. I've taught you these things. He said, follow what you see in me living in. That's exactly what he's saying. He said, that's when, in fact, I think you, well, you've been there before. I'm not going to uh, bring you to Philippians, but it's exactly what he says. He says, I want you to be, I'm going to be the model, but not me, he say, he's, he's not saying I am the model. He's saying what I'm living, how I'm living, that is the model. That's what I want you to actually copy. And uh, that's what he says in, back in Philippians 3. But the point is here, this required extreme training to make it either in the military or in the games. You had to what? Respect authority. If you don't respect authority in the military, you're in nothing but trouble. If you don't respect the authority in the games, you're not going to be uh, you're not going to be honored by the umpires. You're not going to be found to be uh, going according to the rules. So that required extreme training to make it either in the military or in the games or in the ancient world as the athletes. And again, that required that type of thing even as athletes. The ultimate motivation, however, for all of us to desire to become winners should be exactly one reason, one word, and one word only, love. Love for Christ is what keeps us motivated. That's the, that's the training that we need to continue on that path. And so the gymnasiac or the pastor teacher, he also had marshals under him. They watched the athletes and they were analogous to what I showed you, I think last, uh, well, I mean Wednesday evening. They were analogous to the deacons under the authority of the pastor teacher. They're to help the pastor teacher with his authority. He can't be, he can't control the entire church. He has to pass that authority already done. And I think we've done a fine job doing that here because the ones I got in charge, they're men that have been I've got a hard time not making people deacons, let alone who to make deacons because there have been so many men here that have already reached that status where they could fill that role. But there's also been so many ladies, if I could find one that said deaconesses, trust me ladies, I would, but it's not there. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 10 for a moment. The gymnasiac therefore also did something else. Gymnasiac also wore a purple robe. We only got about 15 minutes, so try to bear with it, okay? Especially, I'm going to cut this kind of court. I'm going to cut it at 8.15 anyway, because I want my people to get back home, take a nice rest, and get ready for a nice two, what are you going to be here, two, three weeks? Four weeks? Four weeks, maybe. Good. We want you guys just to have a good time, enjoy yourself. But I'm going to go as long as I can, and we'll just have... A nice time wrapping up this great subject. Anyway, the gymnasiac also wore, what, a purple robe with white sandals. I find this interesting because it's analogous to the pastor or the evangelist who, are told by, who we are told by the Apostle Paul in Romans 10, 15, that their feet are beautiful. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of what good news. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Go to 1 Corinthians 3. The sixth analogy here, after the completion of the 10th month course, this is the sixth analogy as far as the games in the military was concerned, the athlete was allowed to compete, but that's after he completed the 10 month course. You're turning to 1 Corinthians 3. Again, after the completion of the 10-month course, the athlete was allowed to compete. Number seven, the athlete also followed a very strict set of rules which constantly tested his motivation or her motivations. Females are functioning in this as well, just like church-age believers. Uh, do equal privilege, equal opportunity. Uh, you also have the decisions. They, they, they are tested. They were tested. The momentum. All these things, you know, it wasn't what they would just achieve. It was what was their motivation. Now, you know, sometimes they'll like question certain like, I don't know, beauty pageants. What do you think about this? Same thing. They had a lot of these examinations that were also, that also revealed motivation, decisions, and momentum. The point is there's a lot more that goes into it than what, it, what you know, hits the surface. But that's because, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse 13. What does the Bible say we're going to be evaluated as of one day? Not just what we do do, each man's work will become evident, the Apostle Paul says, because the day is going to show your work and how much work that was done, because that day will be revealed with fire, and the fire was going to test the quality of each man's what? Work. 
What's going to be tested? Quality, motivation, momentum. So it's a lot more than just, you know, uh, abiding by these ten particular rules or whatever, however many I'm going to give you. And look at First Corinthians chapter 4, since we're right around the corner. Same principle is mentioned. One that's overlooked because a lot of people, a lot of believers even seem to, they, they seem to look at the end justifying the means. That's not true. You've got to realize why you're doing what you're doing. What is the reason that you're doing it? And what power are you doing when you do it? Or what power are you operating in when you do it? Verse 4, verse 5, 1 Corinthians 4, the Apostle Paul says, Therefore do not go, pass on, go, go on passing judgment before the time. He's talking about people who are judging before they have all the facts. He says, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait. Wait until the Lord comes, rapture of the church, second coming, whatever it may be here, it's rapture. He will both bring to light the things which are hidden in the darkness, and he's going to disclose or reveal the what? The motives, motivations of each man's heart. And then each man's praise will come to him for God. What is God looking from God? What is God looking for? He's looking for that correct motivation. The Psalm, Solomon said way back in Proverbs 16 too, he said all the ways of a man, they're clean in his own sight. You may think that what you're doing is clean in your own sight. By the way, do you remember if you've done all that's required for you to do, what to call yourself? A what? An unprofitable servant. Why? You only did that which you were supposed to do. So don't come bragging to me about all the things you do that are so great in the, in the eyes of God and all heaven is dancing, you know, swaying to your entrance. It's not going to happen like that. Look what he says in Proverbs 16 too. All the ways of a man, they're clean in his own sight, but the Lord, he always weighs the motives. Why'd you do that? Why'd you give that? Why'd you go there? Why'd you go there? Why'd you, just, why'd you think this? It doesn't matter. He's going to weigh the motives. And you know, he knows because what does he look at? He looks at the heart. And we can fool him a lot of places. We can't fool him with what goes on upstairs. So this is simply analogous to the, con to the concept of daily perception of doctrine and the momentum testing that's going to take place in your life periodically. We all have to go through it. I will, you will. It doesn't matter how old, how young. We're going to go through situations where our momentum is going to be tested to reveal what our true desire really is. And always remember, you can always quit by the way, just like you can quit on Christianity, just like many have, and many will, and they many will in the future, I'm sure, as well. But here it is. You could not leave for any reason, or you would be disqualified either from the games or from the military. A wall, you're up. You had to wait next time. Next time the games rolled around, or next time the military called for uh, what it calls for, the universal military train or university uh, military training, whatever it is, you're gonna have to wait for the time. But you, you could not leave for any reason, or you would be disqualified. In fact, the Apostle Paul is gonna say something very interesting. You might as well go there now because I'm not gonna get it this evening. But go to First Corinthians nine. Look at verse twenty-four. <clears throat> First Corinthians nine twenty-four. I wish I could get all these to you on time, but then again, I don't because there's so many rich things that come on out of these things as we're teaching them. Here's what Paul said concerning the games. In 1 Corinthians 9, look at verse 24. He says this, he says, Do you not know, back to that phrase again, do you not know that those who run in a race, they all run, but only one receives the prize. He doesn't say let everyone win so you can appear to be humble, all shucks shuffle your feet and that nonsense. No. He says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the, the prize? Then he says, run in such a way that you may what? Win. Why? Everyone who competes in the games, they exercise self-control in all things. Notice that if you compete in those games, this is what we've been talking about, you're going to have to exercise self-control, self-discipline, not just in some things, but in all things. They do it, the ones who do it in time, for at the time this was written, they're doing it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. And he's saying, I'm going to run, but I know where I'm going. I'm not running in a way without aim. I know where I'm aiming. I box in such a way as not beating the air. I'm hitting my target. But I discipline my body and I make it a slave so that after what I preach to others, 
I myself will not be, what? Disqualified. Ooh, I wonder where we get that word from. Disqualified. You don't want that to happen, men. One of the worst, most embarrassing things is going to be for the pastor teachers who taught the truth and people listened to the truth and they grew in the truth and they glorified God in that truth. They reached spiritual maturity. The pastor teacher never did because the pastor teacher did it with the wrong motivation. They did it with the right motivation. They get rewarded. And maybe in the humor of God, he has the pastor ser uh, teacher serving them for the entire eternal state and, you know, clean house or whatever the mansions require. But that's true because the power is not in the man, right? If the power is not in the man, where's the power? It's in the message. So why would we be shocked to realize that someone can benefit from the message without benefiting from the messenger? I'm, I'm pretty hot tonight. I hope you're getting this all, you know. <laughs> it's not normal. No, it's good. Listen, again, you could not leave for any reason or if you, if you did, you'd be what? Disqualified. You'd go AWOL. In other words, that I had an entire doctrine that I taught on the doctrine of going AWOL. And I want you to see something. Go to 1 Peter 5, 3. I can't let you overlook these things because they're so vital, especially in relationship to where we are. But here we're going to be dealing with the pastor teacher, the gymnasiac, the ones that you choose to help you exercise because here, here's what we're told. Everyone did the same exercise under the same authority, which was analogous to us as believers under the same authority of the past that the pastor teacher has. We are now, you are under the same type of authority that other believers are. You have, you are submitting to your pastor. Your pastor also has to lay down his life for you. How do we know that? Look at First Peter 5, look at verse, I mean, look at First Peter 5, 3. Pastor teachers here, notice what they're commanded. They're commanded not to lord it over those allotted to their what? To their charge. What does that mean? I am allotted to your charge. God has assigned you to me. And in doing so, I'm going to make sure I give you the proper information because I am the gymnasiac, if I am the gymnasiac that you are, you are choosing, that I'm going to make sure I give you the proper information that you need to, choose, to reach the goal that you desire, which hopefully is to glorify God. My job is to present that to you. You've been allotted to my charge. The Bible says that if Paul did not do that. If I don't do it, the Bible says I've been disqualified. And that's nothing worse for a pastor teacher not to hear the phrase well done, thou good and faithful servant. He doesn't hear that. Oh, he sees other people in his local assembly who have become good and faithful servants, but not because him, or him, why? not him, why? Because he perceived it, he metabolized it, but perhaps he refused to apply it. He's just like you, and he falls under double discipline. He also falls under double discipline, according to James 3, verse 1. Here, please notice again, you either had a, pa you either have, I'm going to deal with you now as a, pa as a pastor dealing with a, a student, or someone in the military or however you want the athletic games you are either a pastor teacher or an evangelist or you I'm talking about you now this is true about everyone in your life you are either sitting here right now a pastor teacher or an evangelist I say that as your gift or you have been allotted to submit to the authority of a pastor teacher or an evangelist you've got to make that decision you are either one being trained under one like I was in the past I was trained under Colonel Robbie Theme Jr. who I consider to be one of the greatest theologians of the last century so he was my pastor teacher I was a pastor teacher but he was mine as I was growing up same thing with Pastor Betez and Pastor Kabrick and about 20 other guys they said that I was their pastor teacher so they were here at as pastor teachers and evangelists. Other than that, every one of you have been assigned to someone else. I know that because in Acts 20 verse 28, who's been, who have I been assigned to? You. The Holy Spirit has made me an overseer of you. So we both have that principle of accountability. And again, let me say this again. This means you have been appointed by God to a pastor teacher who has been elected or chosen by God to teach you the mystery doctrine of the church age. It means you all have been appointed that. 
You've been all appointed to a pastor teacher who has been elected by God, chosen by God, to teach you the mystery doctrine of the church age. The only exception are those who are growing in that gift of evangelism and on the gift of pastor teacher, which they still have to grow in the same realm as the rest of the congregation. But it just takes them, they, they will, once they reach that, that place where they can exercise their gift, it shall be done. If not, God will use that individual as an indictment against other people that they could have had a doctrinal teacher but they, they did not want one. There are many geographical locations throughout the country that have never ever expressed positive volition to God. So God says, I'm going to raise up all kinds of prepared pastors who never get to exercise their gift to them because of their negative volition. As far as those pastors are concerned, winner pastors. They'll hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Why will they hear that? Because they did their job. They prepared themselves. They did it as unto the Lord. They elevated people's lives. They gave them what the information they needed as athletes or as, as uh, soldiers. They did their part. They'll receive a reward. Just like a child. If a child dies at age one years old and God can look down the corridor of time and say, if that child was not murdered, that child would have all these rewards. You know the story. God blesses that as well. My whole point here is that no matter which direction we go, and doesn't is any great? Doesn't he have like everything under control? Aren't you excited about these things? Because I sure am. Listen, I am responsible to teach you the mystery doctrine of the church age, and you are responsible to learn it. And that's it, buddy. Now let's have a good time enjoying each other's fellowship instead of picking on each other, judging each other. She does this, she does this, he eats this, he eats that, he smokes this, he goes there. Who cares? Get a life. Listen, finally, I'm going to leave you this last one. There were eight to ten exercise periods during the day which demanded that everyone would be prepared and ready to exercise at all times. Again, part of the spiritual life. He says you have, listen, he doesn't say you have to take in doctrine when I say so. When Pastor Bob says it's time to turn in your Bibles, that's when you have to do it. Or you have to be at the church when he's teaching. No, you have, you could have eight or ten times during the day, especially in the times we're living in. We live in the dispensation where we can study the Word of God eight to ten times because of the Internet. But you can take it in any way you want. But I'll tell you it's something you cannot do. You cannot, and you're one of the very few generations that cannot, you cannot offer an excuse to God. You have no excuse to say why you did not remain positive toward doctrine and become a winner and not. That's close. Thank you, Father, for again the privilege you've given us to gather together to study your word. Strengthen us through this power of the word that we've heard this evening and strengthen all of us as we go forward in your plan. Bring glory to you. May this entire weekend do so, Father. May you bless my daughter and the children as they come back from where they are as well, Father. And I ask that your blessing be with all of us as we leave this evening. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for our people that blow that way from the other side of the world, Father, just to be with us, to Australia. Thank you for that. Challenge us, be with us for the rest of the night. In Christ's name, we do pray. Amen.